Tony and I are staying because uh, we're talking about Afghanistan and the, and the global order briefly. And we have um, Governor Ajmal Ahmadi. Good to see you. Um, and uh, he was uh, the last central bank governor of Afghanistan before the country fell, and he had to evacuate on very on no notice uh, out of the country. And I guess the first question to ask you, given what you've just heard from this panel, I mean, there's probably no country in the world that's been affected more by a changing global order over the centuries than Afghanistan. I'm wondering, given the experience you've just gone through, not the best, um, with the with sudden withdrawal of the U.S. and its allies and the collapse of your government and the takeover of the Taliban, um, have you thought, does it make you think differently today about the global order? Does it make you think differently about the United States, about China, about India, about the way that your country relates to other major powers around it? Thank you very much for having me on the panel. Um, I think it does um, in a number of ways. So right now, uh, no one expected the government to collapse as quickly as it did in Afghanistan. I don't think um, I myself did, uh, regional governments did, or even the United States. Uh, and so right now, a number of countries are realigning and trying to figure out what's the right approach to dealing with the Taliban. Um, so maybe I'll address it first from a regional perspective and then more broadly. Um, you know, I think most countries in the region are taking a look at Afghanistan through security prism now and are trying to figure out how to best protect their interests. Uh, whether it's Russia, China, or, or India, they're worried about uh, narcotics flows, security, or um, refugees spilling over into their borders. Um, so I think there, um, it was a little bit surprising uh, over the past few years as a, as a part of a government to see um, a number of these countries uh, hedge their bets uh, in order to, to make sure that if the Taliban took power that they would be, um, have a good relationship with them. So from the perspective of, of someone who worked there, that, that was, I think, something that changed my perspective. I think more broadly, taking a look at um, the global stage, um, I think uh, I view the Doha deal, which was signed um, as not protecting, of course, uh, by the Trump administration, yeah. by, the Biden, uh, by the Trump administration, mm -hmm. uh, as not protecting Afghanistan, but also n not in the interests of the U.S. government as well. And so um, that, that was also a shift, a paradigm shift during that period, which I found difficult to, to reconcile. Um, and so I think um, the countries in the region and now uh, the entire um, global community is grappling with how to deal with the Taliban government that's coming to power. Your, your expectations going forward, you know, is it most likely this becomes a failed state? Is it most likely that to the extent that anyone has influence, it's primarily China, Pakistan, Russia, not the West more broadly? Push back as hard as you want on that. I think right now, Afghanistan is not a failed state. Let me explain why. I think the Taliban have control of the administration and the bureaucracy, um, and so uh, they have control of that lever. Uh, they have control of the security agencies, including the Ministry of Interior, Defense, and Intelligence. Although there are some attacks by Daesh and others, um, right now they're in control. Um, political opposition is there, but it's fragmented uh, and dispersed. I think the key concern right now is on the economic front. So Afghanistan ran a $7 billion trade deficit on a GDP of $20 billion. That was entirely financed through international aid, which has been completely frozen, and the international assets have been frozen. And so you're going to have to have a rebalance of the balance of payments or external accounts in Afghanistan to a new reality. And that implies a very steep uh, GDP contraction on the order of perhaps 30 to 40 percent. We've seen that in other countries around the world, in Syria, in Lebanon, um, uh, perhaps in, in Libya. Uh, but those countries were starting out with a much higher GDP per capita rate. In Afghanistan, the GDP per capita was approximately $500. And now with a collapse of 40%, you're talking about GDP declining to perhaps $300 per capita. And that's where we run into this humanitarian crisis, because at that level, people don't have enough uh, money to buy basic commodities. And so as that continues and those dynamics continue to play out, I think you're going to have um, instability created, perhaps people joining opposition forces. And that's where we potentially lead to a failed state. Thank you for that. Now, I mean, historically, 
you've had a lot of involvement directly, your government, uh, with the global war on terror. Um, we see what's happened. I, I completely understand why the United States and others would want to withdraw after all the bloodshed, all the hardship, all the money spent in Afghanistan. To what extent do you believe that you, the United States, the UK, its allies, have an ongoing obligation to Afghanistan? And what concretely does that mean? I would say, yes, we, we do. Um, and as you know, I have expressed my disagreement with the, the decision to, uh, to withdraw, but that's, that's now um, happened. I think the really hard question today is what, what, is our, what is a posture that is realistic in the circumstances we, we face? And, you know, my, my feeling is most with the Afghan people. And, you know, when you see what's actually happening to the country, I mean, one of the strange things that I think that happened in Western opinion, because it hadn't really focused on Afghanistan for a long period of time, what happened when the collapse took place and the Taliban took over is, you know, I had people saying to me in the UK, but I, I didn't know all that had happened, that girls were in school and, you know, Kabul had completely changed. And yeah, we, we only heard about the problems. We didn't realize there had actually been some successes. And I think part of the problem for Afghanistan today, I mean, I was talking to a European leader who's taking in some of the Afghan refugees. And, you know, refugee issues are very sensitive and difficult in Europe. But he's, he said to me, I've started to go through the list of the refugees. And actually, there's some very talented people in here who's going to be coming and settling in my country. But you've got to think from the point of view of Afghanistan, those people who are most educated, most capable, most able to put the country back on its feet are all either leaving or wanting to leave. So I think, look, when you, sometimes you learn in politics when you can't solve a problem, you're going to have to manage it. We're going to have to manage it as best we can, particularly in humanitarian terms. But I think it's really difficult because as far as I can make out, but of course the, His Excellency knows much better than me, I think the Taliban is also divided. I would say the governing capacity is extremely limited. As he's just indicated, the assets are frozen, the aid has stopped. So we're going to have to try and deal with what will be a real humanitarian, well, is a real humanitarian disaster, but without giving the Taliban the legitimacy that they will try and extract a lot of concessions for. But it's, you know, I don't, I look at this situation and to be frank, I find it very hard to work out right now what the right response should be. So closing big global question for you. We discussed here how we thought that China was going to become more politically open. We were wrong. We hoped that Russia after the collapse was going to move towards being a democracy. It didn't. Um, Ukraine. Syria, Afghanistan. I mean, these are countries that the US and the West have been very involved in, no longer really in big pieces of it, in the case of Ukraine and the countries more broadly. What, what does that say to you about the future of the global order? And what do you think we need to do differently as a consequence? I think what we need to do, as someone who was in power, very much involved post 9-11, I think we need to we can learn the lessons of what some people would call overreach back then, but we can learn those lessons. But it's important we don't draw the lesson that we go to the opposite extreme. There's still a need for American power. There's still a need for the alliance that is based on the values I was describing earlier. And one of the, the problems when people talk about wanting to end intervention from a, I don't just mean military intervention, I mean a very active policy in the world from the West the problem is, if the West doesn't have an active policy, if it's not there standing with its allies in a consistent way, don't think that what happens is that no one else moves into that space. They do move into that space. And if you think what's happened in Syria, by the way, look, in Syria, where after all the military intervention there was to prop up a dictatorship, not to remove one, whatever else you say about President Putin, Russia stayed the course. Iran stayed the course. 11 years later, or 10 years later, 
Assad's still in power and the region's feeling that they have to deal with them. So my point about the West is in the end, it's also about having staying power. And it's about understanding that your and our ability to affect the world will ultimately affect our own interests. And the reason for us having an engaged foreign policy, building alliances, is not because we don't want to put our own countries first. I mean, whoever, whoever in politics doesn't want to say Britain first or America first, of course our country always comes first. But the question is, what does coming first mean in an interdependent world? And what it means to me is you need to be also engaged with your uh, allies in shaping that world because that is in your interests. And the reason for having that engaged foreign policy with your allies is not in denial of your self-interest, it's in satisfaction of what I would call an enlightened self-interest. Tony Blair, Ajmal Akhmadi, thank you very much.